Hey everyone, Nathan here. We have a really interesting project today. It's a bit more in the academic field, especially in the academic economic field than we have had on the show in recent times. And I wanted to explain a little bit about what the project is before I get into the interview, because once we started the interview, we only got to explaining what the project was about halfway through. The project is called Ampleforth. The point of it is to reflect changes in demand by changing the quantity of Ampleforth available rather than changing the price. So, for example, if I had purchased one Ample for $1 and demand increased and my Ample was worth $2, then the system would adjust and give me an extra Ample so that with this increased supply, the price would go back down to $1. So I would have two Amples for $1. So overall, at the end of the system, I would uh, I would reflect that increase of value in the number of Amples I held as opposed to reflecting it in long-term price spikes and drops. This has really interesting applications for banks and for uh, the cryptocurrency market in general and in all sorts of really interesting macroeconomic applications. It's something that's very different than we've seen before. And now uh, we can hear it from the horse's mouth himself. So please enjoy this interview with Evan Kuo, founder and CEO of Appleforth. This is the Analysis in Change with Nathan Williams and Neil Kieran. <laughs> Welcome to Analysis in Chains. I'm Nathan Williams. Joining me today is Evan Kuo. Evan Kuo is the founder and CEO of Ampleforth. Now, Ampleforth is described as a smart commodity money. I've talked with Evan a little bit before this, before we started recording. It is very academic. And what I want to do today is I want to go through the different aspects of the project and really understand the mechanics of it. So Evan, thank you for coming on my show. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to kind of talk to you guys and happy to answer any questions that you might have. So tell me a little bit about Ampleforth. Uh, what is a smart commodity money? So smart commodity money is, is a bit of a tagline. Um, it, it comes from this uh, monetary classification that economists are using for assets like Bitcoin called synthetic commodity money. Now, a synthetic commodity money um, it has certain properties of natural commodity monies, right? Like wheat, rubber, oil, gold, silver, but also has certain qualities of fiat, right? Um, so in the case of Bitcoin as a synthetic commodity money, it is absolutely scarce, right? Like natural commodities are, um, but also has no non-monetary use case like fiat. So that means you can't eat it. You can't fashion it into jewelry. And uh, because there's kind of this classic dichotomy between commodity monies and fiat, uh, the economists have uh, decided that Bitcoin doesn't fit into either of those classifications and created a new classification called synthetic commodity money. Ample when we say, okay, uh, sorry, sorry, just I, I want to ask, when we say a commodity money, what is the difference between a commodity money and co a commodity? Right. So a commodity has some sort of use value, like in the case of wheat, it can be consumed or in the case of gold, it can be created into jewelry and such. Right. But a commodity money, uh, I think, refers to the, the, the monetary use case of such commodities. So if I've got a paper, a paper version of uh, uh, or uh, an order for 100 tons of wheat, that would be a commodity money. But if the wheat is actually delivered, that's the commodity itself. Um, no, no. I think the way that we think about it is that all of these assets have money-like properties. Like, for example, even this cup on my table that I'm looking at has some sort of store value you know, property, right? So it has some monetary quality to it, um, but uh, it itself is a cup, right? And so in the case of wheat, it's, it's a consumable good. It's a commodity, but it also has exchange value, nominal exchange value on secondary marketplaces, and can be used to kind of store value, um, you know, and so on and so forth, just as gold can be. And so when we talk about a commodity money, uh, I think we're talking about the monetary use case of a commodity. Uh, so Bitcoin is a synthetic commodity money in that we can 
Uh, it's a new classification in that we can exchange it like a money. It is a commodity in that it is limited, but it is not uh, not like a commodity in that there's no other non-money use for it. That's right. And all right. So I'm with you so far. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so just, just to restate that as succinctly as possible, it, it's an asset with absolute scarcity, right? And no non-monetary use value. Perfect. Absolute scarcity and no non-monetary use value. Yep. And so when we're talking about uh, now a smart commodity money. So as you probably know, Bitcoin is a fixed supply asset, right? And that makes it a little bit like gold um, in that it's completely predictable in its supply policy and non-dilutive. Um, so a smart commodity money like ours it is still non-dilutive, but its supply changes in response to demand. So the way I kind of tend to describe amples is um, it's a lot like thermal expansion. So if you, if you imagine like Mercury, you pour it into a cylinder, you put it in contact with a hot body, right? It naturally expands. If you remove it from contact from the hot body, it naturally contracts. Um, amples do that. Um, amples expand and contract, uh, not in response to kinetic energy, but instead in, in response to uh, a nominal exchange rate. Um, now, one of the really cool things about smart con contract platforms like Ethereum and such um, is we can kind of design these systems however we want. So unfortunately, materials like mercury don't have great monetary qualities, you know, portability, divisibility, availability, fungibility. Um, but we can kind of imbue the properties of a natural resource like mercury um, with monetary qualities. And, and of course, instead of having it expand and contract as a result of temperature, have it expand and contract in supply as a result, as a result result of exchange rate. And the motivation for this really is picking up from where natural commodities like gold and silver um, kind of fall apart as, as base monies in supporting a large economy. So uh, if you remember, um, you know, at the end of Bretton Woods, 1971, um, we canceled redeemability into gold. Uh, and the reason we did this is for fear of, uh, of runaway deflation. So uh, because natural commodity monies like gold and silver have such limited supply elasticity, they can't really be considered macroeconomically friendly. And that's how we kind of ended up in a situation where we survive primarily off of fiat money. Um, and, and fiat money really, I mean, I think the great innovation there is, you know, it has no non-monetary use, yes, um, but also it's the production cost of fiat money is very low. So what I mean by that is it doesn't really cost us more to create a $1,000 bill than it does to create a $1 bill. And that's what enables um, supply elasticity. That's what allows it to be macroeconomically friendly when in the hands of the right people. So uh, because it's so potentially elastic, responsible poly policymakers can enact what they call counter cyclical policies where, um, you know, if prices are rising relative to the cost of money, they can increase supply. And if prices are falling, they can decrease supply and so on and so forth. Now, the downside of that is it's highly discretionary. Um, there, there's kind of a long standing narrative, um, you know, introduced back in the day uh, in, in a paper called Rules versus Monetary Authorities. But today it's referred to as the rules versus discretion debate. And and fiat is very much discretionary. It's, it's at the at the whim and deliberate policymaking discretion of people um, as opposed to rules based. And that's what's interesting about Bitcoin because Bitcoin's supply policy is absolutely enforced by a set of rules. It's non-discretionary. And so, you know, just thinking about, you know, the high level trade-off, right? When we had redeemability to gold, it was great because it was non-discretionary, it's automatic, impersonal, uh, completely scarce, but really inelastic, right? So because the production cost of gold is so high, and it's also very difficult to delete gold, it's not really a macroeconomically friendly base money, which is why we made this transition into fiat, which is highly elastic because its production cost is very low. Now, unfortunately, what happened as a result is we put the fate of fiat in the hands of um, policymakers. And so yes. when economists kind of think about this, right, they think about um, gold, again, as having a long run equilibrium price equal to its cost of production. So when they model long run equilibrium price, they can just set it as equal to its marginal cost of production. 
Uh, now, in the case of fiat, uh, there really isn't a long run equilibrium price right? because of the cost of product production is, is marginally small. In order to model a long run equilibrium price, you would have to take into consideration all the future policy making on behalf of that currency. And because those decisions are highly discretionary, it just doesn't have a long run equilibrium price. You would have to be able to predict the future and That's people try. Right. Yeah. But- and, and so I would say also in the case of Bitcoin, so this is one of the things that makes Bitcoin different from gold. It also does not have a long run equilibrium price because the difficulty and mining costs of Bitcoin is a lagging indicator of demand. Um, you can't really say that Bitcoin has a long run equilibrium price either. And so that's what makes it kind of like a natural commodity money and also like fiat. And and that's why they call it a synthetic commodity money, which is something a little bit different. So if I can just state back a couple of the things that you said in my own words, sure. because uh, it, it really does sound like we're looking at macroeconomic policies and how they might apply to uh, to different commodities and especially uh, relating to Bitcoin, to gold and silver. Mm. And, um, and this is... Uh, an area that I don't actually often think about, which is the macroeconomic space. Mm-hmm. So as I understand it, the, the, the way that we would deal with gold and silver is that we dig them out of the ground. There's a certain cost to produce them. And okay. in the long run, the price of gold and silver will be proportional to the cost that it takes to extract and refine them and to get them into the market. That's right. And with Bitcoin, the problem is that you do have a fixed supply. They're produced according to an algorithm. But mm-hmm. how hard it is to get uh, to get a Bitcoin out of that algorithm changes mm-hmm. depending on how many people are in the system, and that sort of um, that gets reset every uh, every certain number of blocks when we see how many people are actually mining the Bitcoin, and so it's hard to predict it in the future. That's right. It also does not have a long run equilibrium price. Right. And with fiat, it's uh, a similar sort of issue that the, there are central banks and policymakers that will, uh, that will put forward policies that will determine interest rates and ultimately the money supply. And, mm-hmm. uh, and those are difficult to predict because there's discretion involved. There's people behind those decisions. Exactly. And so the ability to predict sort of the the price of that money or sort of what that money can buy and how valuable it is, is difficult. So I guess that uh, that, bring, that brings us to your project. <laughs> right. So, I mean, from an economic theory perspective, what's really fascinating about Amples is they introduce a long run equilibrium price that's unrelated to cost of production. So one thing that Bitcoin hearkens to, but doesn't take advantage of is low production costs, right? So because it does have this adjustable mining difficulty, it's not really benefiting as much from the, the low production costs, low theoretical production costs of a digital asset, not the way fiat benefits from its low production costs. Right? No, it's so, almost the opposite. They want to increase the production cost in order to make it valuable and to secure the network or what have you. Right. But it definitely speaks to the intriguing possibility Right, that an asset can be created that does have this property of natural commodity monies, a long run equilibrium price, right, and also does have the best of fiat, which is high supply elasticity. And that's where Amples comes into the picture from a macroeconomics perspective. Now, I would say there's also another really, really interesting feature of Amples, and that specifically um, is that it will have a different movement pattern from today's digital assets. So it'll actually move in a step function like manner. So you can think of all of today's digital assets as moving according to an an analog signal, right? Even traditional assets as well. Uh, This one will be a little bit different um, because of how the supply policy works. um, You can't really think of price alone as a proxy for gains and losses. You have to think about the product of price and supply, which is market cap. So price times supply is market cap. Market cap really is uh, the proxy for gains and losses in our system. And for this reason, um, it will actually move differently in the marketplace. And that's really important because the coins today are very highly correlated, which means you can't really diversify. So as you buy more and more cryptocurrencies, usually we're told that we shouldn't put all of our eggs in one basket. As we buy more and more cryptocurrencies, um, it kind of feels like they are all in the same basket, right? So we're increasing our beta for sensitivity to the general market movement. And this is because they're also highly correlated. 
And so diversification works, right, by, by putting uncorrelated assets in a basket, right, that reduce the covariance between assets in the portfolio, which allows you to kind of increase expected returns and decrease risk. So diversification is one of only two commonly employed risk reduction methods, um, the other being hedging, and has basically seen, you know, relentless use since the introduction of modern portfolio theory in 1953 or so. It's interesting that we're pretty much everything in the cryptocurrency world is pegged to the Bitcoin price, as you're saying. It's all very highly correlated. And more than likely because everything is being driven by what most people who are investing in cryptocurrency understand. They hear Bitcoin first, then they hear Ethereum, and only then they start to look at all the altcoins. And so everything sort of rises and falls with this Bitcoin price. Yeah, I would I would also say that's one of the most fascinating things about Bitcoin. So um, I think in general, you know, Bitcoin really is an uncorrelated asset. So it doesn't really have exposure to traditional asset groups. It's a, it's a small cap coin in a potentially enormous market that's uncorrelated with traditional assets. And that's what makes it so interesting for portfolio construction. I mean, we see financial engineers, they've been trying to create synthetic portfolios for a long time. But never have we seen the likes of Bitcoin's randomness. And that's what makes it a natural fit for portfolio construction. That is interesting. But Evan, we've, yeah. we've talked for 15 minutes about the basis of why you are creating your project, but we haven't actually introduced your project yet. Right. So. You're right. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the long setup because it does take some background to, uh, to kind of understand and appreciate our project. But yeah, the protocol is actually very simple. Right. So amples, right, uh, receive information from trusted oracles and increase or decrease supply in response to demand. But we do so proportionally and directly to users. So you can kind of imagine this um, like like so. So imagine Alice purchased one ample for a dollar. Mm -hmm. Now demand increased such that she now has one ample worth two dollars. In this case, the protocol would seek a price supply equilibrium such that instead of having one ample worth two dollars alice has two amples each worth one dollar so that's it's it's it naturally seeks this price supply equilibrium and correspondingly right if demand were to decrease right let's just say alice had um you know two amples right each worth two uh, in aggregate worth two dollars right but the price exchange rate went down the the protocol would contract supply it would seek to have, make sure that she only has one ample worth of a dollar. So it's really trying to seek this price supply equilibrium such that one, each unit is worth a dollar, but the supply of and, and the quantity of amples that she has can increase and decrease in response to exchange rate. This is absolutely fascinating. It's different than anything else I've heard. Yeah. Let me just try and wrap my head around this. <laughs> okay. So so I so so I buy I buy an ample for one dollar, demand goes up. Amples are now worth $2, and then the algorithm kicks in and says, well, it's worth $2, but now you have two amples each worth $1. So you have the same value in right. cryptocurrency, but now you have more of them. Right. It's almost like a stock splitting and merging, but of course, not quite. So the intricacies of how this plays out is, is really important, right? So because um, just giving you more supply doesn't mean you're going to correspondingly adjust your price bid. So Imagine today you've got one ample worth $2, right? Now we're giving you more amples. Let's say we gave you one additional ample. There will be a window in time in which you now have two amples each worth $2, right? This is before traders decide to correspondingly adjust price down. And so what's happening is we're applying pressure by giving everybody more supply, which creates this limited window for intra-order book arbitrage. So there's a limited window in time where you now have two amples each worth $2, right? And you're saying, okay, I, could, I should sell. Um, and that sell action is what drives price to correct itself. So what the protocol is really doing is it's applying a gradual pressure, right? Uh, by increasing supply to token holders when people are starting to hoard and hold. It, that it creates a little bit of sell pressure gradually. And then uh, when people are starting to sell, it creates a little bit of buy pressure by limiting the supply. And that, that's what we call a counter cyclical pressure. This I can see being very interesting from a macroeconomic point of view. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you have sort of this self-correcting 
coin that yeah. seeks a price and seeks uh, seeks a money supply that will bring stability into a grander ecosystem. Right? That's right. That's right. What is the what is the benefit for the individuals who are using this, and is the benefit uh, is the benefit aligned with the benefit of uh, the the overall ecosystem? Absolutely. I mean, I would say that one of the things we really love about this protocol is it has a very near term value proposition that dovetails naturally into a much much bigger vision. So, um, you know, I would say that to the individual, there's of course the speculative interest, right? So because it's non-dilutive, right? So when we increase supply proportionally, if you own 1% of the ample supply at a $10 million cap, you'll forever own 1% of the supply. So let's just say it goes to a hundred million dollar cap. You'll just have 1% of a hundred million dollar cap. Um, now the difference is that that value is reflected not only in price, but in the quantity of amples you hold. So in that sense, it's it's non-dilutive. It, it doesn't extract any profits from inflation, for example, right? Uh, the second benefit is there's this intra-order book arbitrage that is very interesting to um, traders because, as I said, there's this mounting pressure to sell that's being created when people are keeping the price high and and, and a mounting pressure to buy when, when people are keeping the price low. Um, and really because these traders will be looking at you know the product of price and supply as a proxy for gains and losses, They'll have to devise new trading um, methodology. So you can't just take a Bitcoin bot, right, which looks at things like simple moving average or price action and buy and sell based on it, right? Because really um, gains and losses are not reflected entirely in price. They're, they're reflected in both price and quantity. And for this reason, the token itself will actually move differently. Now, that's even in, more interesting from a slightly broader perspective, but not too broad, right? Because the fact that the coin moves differently means it could be considerably less correlated with Bitcoin than other assets. And that makes it a natural fit for portfolio diversification within crypto, which is not really part of the toolkit today. You can't simply buy a basket of cryptocurrencies and feel as though you've reduced risk. Right now, when you buy a basket of cryptocurrencies, you actually layer up on your beta. And so diversification really isn't part of the toolkit with Amples. Um, it will be, right? So longer term, Right. So over time, as as the asset grows in liquidity and volume and so on and so forth, um, it, it could become actually um, something that, you know, is is used as collateral in a decentralized bank like MakerDAO, for example. Right. So right now they're collateralized entirely by ETH. And of course, it going up and down just a single asset um, is not is not a desirable situation. And of course, if they add more crypto specific collateral into that bank, those things will likely also move up and down simply with ETH or Bitcoin, right? But a different moving asset like Amples could be used as a natural fit in a decentralized bank. For the same reason, it would be a natural fit for portfolio construction. Now, longer, longer term, right? So this is something that could serve as a potential alternative to central bank deposits or fiat money. So, um, Really, the only problem we had with gold is uh, that it's subject to runaway deflation. So the great thing about gold is it's non-discretionary, it's impersonal, it's automatic, it's invulnerable to runaway inflation, but it's vulnerable to runaway deflation. So if you remember how that spiral works, what happens is when the purchasing power of gold increases, right? Um, you know, prices relative to gold fall, right? And the production of rate of gold increases, it tries to increase supply a little bit, but it can only move so much because of the high production costs, right? And so, mm -hmm. so what happens is a person who thinks that, you know, well, my, my nugget of gold can buy one refrigerator today, but I think it's going to buy two refrigerators tomorrow, they hold that gold, right? And that becomes a self reinforcing cycle, because now there's even less gold in circulation, which therefore increases the purchasing power of gold even further. And that can actually really stall an economy. And this is really why we went off the Bretton Woods system in, in 1971. So if only, right, that natural commodity money was elastic and, and specifically counter cyclical in its elasticity, then you would have um, really a monetary asset that would be ideally suited as, as a base money. So something that you could construct a banking system on top of. And, you know, I just want to be clear that there, there's a distinction between the theory of banking and the theory of money. So, Stablecoin assets like Tether are kind of like a, a private um, bank, a centralized private bank. 
um, and, and, you know, projects like Dai and, and Make are more like a decentralized bank, right? So mm-hmm. I would say that Amples is neither of those things. It's not a bank at all. It never retakes custody. It never airdrops. So when we increase and decrease supply, we do so by programmatically editing this um, global like coefficient of expansion. So in that sense, it's also very much like thermal expansion, but it, Amples are a commodity money, not a bank. And, and really, but it's the type of commodity money that you could um, one day construct a banking infrastructure atop. Let me ask you uh, something because uh, I want to go back to what you were talking about, the intra-order book arbitrage. Definitely. That seems to be a important feature of Amples that at certain points when the value of an ample has gone up, suddenly mm-hmm. I have double my amples. Mm-hmm. They'll still be worth the same price until we uh, people realize mm-hmm. I have double. I want to start selling them, and that brings the price back down to baseline. Right? That's right. That's right. Now, because it's a, because the uh, for a very brief time the we have. Uh, this arbitrage opportunity, this opportunity where I have double the supply, but the price is still the same. Mm -hmm. If I move fast enough, I -hmm. can sell and take advantage. Someone will buy and, and maybe I can take advantage of this. Now this seems like it would suck value out of the system over time. It does not. So that's the beauty of it. So this is, you know, kind of an anti-fragile system. So really I think the way to imagine it is like, just imagine you're looking at a 200 day moving average, right? And just imagine amples are trading at one and then they leave the price threshold. Let's just say they go to two for let's say 30 days and then return back to one. So, so imagine like if you're just thinking about price alone um, at time one, before it leaves the peg, it, it's a dollar, right? And then at time two, after it returns to the price target, it's, it's a dollar. Like you might look at this as a trader and say like, well, you know, whether I bought or sold doesn't really matter. You know, it's the price is a dollar. I haven't really gained anything. But if you looked at the corresponding supply curve, right, you would actually see a step up. So what you would see is a, 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 a supply count of, let's say, X, right, at moving to a supply count of, say, 2X, right? And so because everybody got an increase in amples, uh, gains were had, right? And as traders think about this, right, what what they ultimately need to do is, you know, choose to take advantage of this limited window of opportunity or not. But that doesn't affect the holder. So if you held through, like I said before, if you have, you know, one uh, percent of the supply before, you'll always have one percent of the supply until you sell. And so this arbitrage opportunity is not it's not risk free. So what's happening in that event is. Uh, the traders will have to guess where the next equilibrium supply target or market cap will be. And that's how they'll determine whether they want to sell or buy. Um, and so I see just as uh, just as, you know, market makers who trade on volatility day to day with Bitcoin um, don't have quite a, a risk free return. Right. N- neither do these intra border book arbitrage traders for amples. Right? So the holders benefit from the long term trajectory of gains just fine. But for the, for the other, for the day traders, there's kind of a micro game where you're like, okay, it, supply's increasing, but I don't think people are actually going to sell until 10 days into it. That's when I think the optimal point will be, because I think the market cap will land uh, at like, let's say 75 million, right? Now, so, so if I'm wrong and I think the market and the market cap actually lands higher, then I'll have sold a little bit too early. But, and if I'm wrong and I think the market cap will land a little bit you know, lower, then I'll also have timed it incorrectly as well. So it's not quite risk-free. I think where I was going wrong was that I was thinking of our toy solution where I have one ample, it goes up to two. Now I have two amples worth two. So I technically have four. And if I sell now Mm -hmm. uh, at least half of them, then I'll have my original ample when the price goes back down plus this extra and eventually leach from the system. But it's also possible that the price could continue to go up. Yes. And even if you just held, right, you would have gone from one ample worth $1 at the end to two amples each worth a dollar, which is two. So you'll, you'll still have increased in value. You just won't be necessarily playing that day trading game. So the, there's really just kind of different profiles of investors. And, and we kind of even expand into this into a, in our paper in a section titled Thinking Fast and Slow, 
where we categorize, you know, the agents in our system into fast acting agents and slow acting agents and kind of characterize how, how it would be like for them. Well, Evan, this is a very interesting project. Uh, who have been your early adopters and supporters? Yeah, I mean, so we got really lucky. I mean, um, so, you know, Brandon and I, my co-founder and our, C- our CTO, have known each other for years. Um, he's actually, um, you know, he was a Google search ranking and indexing engineer for years um, and was college friends with like Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase. And when we started getting together and, and talking about this, and you know, I kind of brought in my friend Paul at Pantera and, and we were able to put together a really interesting round of folks. So our seed round uh, was led by True Ventures, which is, you know, a top tier venture capital seed fund out here in San Francisco, but also has participation from folks like Pantera Capital, FPG Capital, Founder Collective, Slow Ventures, Brian Armstrong, um, Hobie Capital. So we really did put together a very interesting mix of people who really know how to think long term about early stage projects and people who really do understand the cryptocurrency markets today. Um, and yeah, we've, we've also actually uh, worked very closely with um, some academic advisors at the Hoover Institute at Stanford. So that's actually a political and economic think tank. Um, and Neil Ferguson over there, our advisor, is a senior fellow. He's also a published author. He's kind of written the definitive history of money. Um, but, you know, he, Oxford professor, Harvard professor, now Stanford senior fellow at Hoover Institute. That, that's also you know, a position that was once held by Milton Friedman. But really, the short of it is they sit in a building full of people who have been thinking about monetary economics for decades. Um, so when they look upon what's happening in the crypto space, they're fascinated. In fact, they've been following it since the beginning of Bitcoin. Um, and a lot of the questions that are out there um, just still circulating amongst the crypto community today they thought very deeply about and, and even published papers about. Um, and, and that's really something that I feel we, we want to bring to the space. Um, I, w- I want to show people that there really is a direct connection between economic theory and crypto today. Um, and that, that really kind of begins with the investigation of synthetic commodity monies. I think what I find fascinating about this project, Evan, is that it really brings me back to the stories of the early days of crypto, where people realized, hey, we can create Bitcoin, we we don't need a trusted third party. What else can we do with it? What new rules can we invent for money that would change the way people interact, that would change incentive models, that would change uh, how, uh, how entire systems would work? And I remember I was speaking with a friend of mine uh, uh, my, my, he was on the show at one point, uh, uh, Josh Shigala, he was the, he's the CEO of Voltoro, And he was saying, you know, one of the early, early days on in the system, people said, what if we had a demurrage coin and mm-hmm. everyone got excited, bought it up. And then the whole bottom fell out of the market. And what was fascinating is that in that entire process, nobody died. There was no bloody revolution. We could yeah. experiment with different f- economic models without having a civil war. And that's the beauty of what we're doing right now. And we can see, will will this work? (laughs) Can we get it to work without shedding blood? And uh, it's fascinating to see a project like this that's really rooted in economic theory uh, that is is going forward. Yeah, I think one of the key distinctions that you pointed to there was like, now we can create new assets. And I think one thing that we've done a lot of thinking on is the question of, well, what would make for an interesting and different and new asset? And when we couldn't answer that question ourselves, we really kind of went outside of our scope and found world-class experts. So rather than thinking, could we create a Demirage coin? We're like, well, does the world need a Demirage coin? Why don't we talk to folks who've been thinking about this, you know, for their entire professional careers and who can draw upon, you know, the history of money from ancient humanity to contemporary theory that has just been published. And so we spend a lot of time asking what sorts of assets are needed and why. Um, and, and really, amples are kind of, you know, the, the semblance of sense we've made of the space thus far. Um, and, yeah, we're just really excited because I think it's going to be the first asset that's that's different. So um, today, you know, when we think about, you know, whether you're decentralizing machine learning or, or Uber or anything else, right, um, if the output is a fixed supply asset, by the time it gets 
into the hands of a trader. It, it's an asset that moves up and down with Bitcoin, right? And um, if it's fixed supply, it's a deflationary asset, right? And so this will really be the first of its kind. And I think, you know, in the crypto world, it'll be, you know, the first different asset that we see out there. Um, and yeah, to your point, you know, the opportunity to have this occur nonviolently, right? Um, you know, <laughs> a, a lot of folks even, you know, were, were they, they never believed that there would be a good reason for a sovereign state to relinquish discretion over their monetary policy. And, and rightfully so, it would, it would be irresponsible for their citizens to do so. And so that this is kind of emerging more organically is, is a really, really kind of special opportunity. In fact, I'm expecting to get on an interview with the, um, the founder of the Occupy Wall Street movement, who now has kind of a graduate school um, to talk about some of this stuff shortly. And I'd be really curious to hear what he has to say as well. No, well, it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you for taking the time to tell us about it and give us a an insight into uh, a little bit more of the academic world uh, uh, corner of uh, the blockchain and crypto sphere. Yeah, if you're curious, I would highly encourage you to check out our website. I know many websites don't say much, but we really went out of our way to kind of try to create educational material. So it's www.ampleforth.org. And we've, we've even written this thing called the Red Book that has, you know, a course on how to trade Amples and a course on the economic theory behind Amples that goes ahead and classifies the asset using peer-reviewed economic theory um, in six different micro chapters. Um, and it's really meant to be very digestible and direct the reader to additional resources if they're curious. That would be www.amplefort.com. Ampleforth. Dot org. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Everybody go and check it out. Thank you very much, Evan, for coming on the show. And uh, good luck with uh, the Ample Forth project. Thank you so much.